Thank you, Bettina, and a warm welcome to all of you to the fourth edition of our uh, EPIC. And uh, I see many familiar faces from past EPICs. It feels a little bit like, like class reunion. Um, my topic is the respective um, risk landscape 2024 and the upcoming challenges. And throughout the day, we will shed light on this and provide you and try to provide you with practical advice. And when I was uh, thinking about how to tackle this, I mean, it would have been easy to just give you my opinion, what I think as semi-thought leader, so to speak, what is uh, upcoming uh, the, the, the next month and, and year. But I want to do it um, differently. So, And I will do it differently. Instead of me giving you um, expectations what the future holds for us, I asked thought leaders in the privacy, information security, and compliance realm to give us their thoughts what, what is up in, in, in store. And and most of them have been participants in previous epics, so it f really feels like a, a, a class reunion. It's uh, best of past epics, so, so to speak. And um, my minor role is only to comment on their predictions and, you know, to put it into a bigger picture. And I will also cover a lot of stuff that Quentin Thomas just mentioned and give you maybe a, a sort of different uh, view. So I'd say let's kick it off with privacy because uh, GDPR, that's how Data Guard and all uh, started. And um, the first person I, I brought you, um, if I had to name one a key influencer in data protection who is um, consistently uh, influencing our community over the past 10 years than it would have been uh, Carlo Pilz. He's a really distinguished lawyer and um, privacy expert. He was also participating in the second uh, edition of EPIC um, in May last year, and he will shed some uh, light on GDPR enforcement practices, something that uh, most of you, I hope, don't uh, have to face in, in practice. Nonetheless, it's a prevalent um, a threat. So let's see what uh, Carlo predicts for next year. First trend, money in the form of fines and also claims for damages under GDPR. In the coming year, the European Court of Justice will have to rule on the interpretation of Article 82 as well as 83, for example, when it comes to the question of the calculation of fines or the liability of group of companies. So, major CGU cases, cases of the European Court of Justice, to be delivered. So what's in store? One topic Carlo just mentioned, and I think it's a very important one, is the European Court of Justice will define and bring clarif clarification on the benchmark for maximum fine calculation. And I don't want to bother you with all the legalese, but there is a discussion whether um, a uh, group of undertakings or undertakings should be interpreted in a very narrow fashion, meaning that it's just a single entity and just the turnover, the annual turnover of this uh, single entity should be um, determined when, when it comes to, to fine calculation. And then there's the, the other side. Most of the supervisory authorities um, hold that opinion, and they draw that from uh, competition law, uh, where undertaking has a broader view, meaning, um, as you can see here, um, the turnover of the entire group of companies. And obviously, that makes a big difference, right? And the European Court of Justice will, end of this year or beginning of next year, rule on that. It's a case from Denmark, and this will be really interesting, because if the turnover of the entire group of companies uh, is the benchmark, then the fines will be much higher, obviously. 
The second thing is he, he, he talked about is liability concept. And that's a, a German case, uh, Deutsche Wohnen. Deutsche Wohnen is a big uh, real estate company uh, sitting in Berlin. And they had to face um, enforcement action by the Berlin Supervisory of Authority. And the questions around that um, is, can companies be the addressee of fines or do you, do you need a natural person behind that acting on behalf of the company and are mere infringements of the GDPR enough or do you need intentional or negligent uh, behavior? And to put it more into, into practice, l l let me shed some light on what happened at Deutsche Wohnen. Um, they, as a big real estate company, did not delete certain tenants data that was no longer needed. And the supervisory authority of Berlin became aware of that and they started investigations and eventually imposed a fine. If I remember correctly, it was about 20 million uh, euros. So for German standards, a quite high fine. And it was a matter of fact. Uh, that deletion was required, but did not happen. So even Deutsche Wohnen, in, in the end, acknowledged that. But the question uh, then arose, and that's why Deutsche Wohnen brought it uh, to court, and now the uh, European Court of Justice has to, to decide on it soon, is, is it enough to stipulate fine on a company, or do you need a person behind it, a person that decided to not delete uh, the data or at least giving order to not do so. So was the authority um, advised to and required to find a person, to find a person who did some misbehavior or is the mere a matter of fact that there was an infringement enough and that's what the case is about and this is also very important because if the CGU decides in favor of that opinion then obviously supervisory authorities have much more effort to do in imposing fines because they need to find a respective culprit. So that's the first thing we have in store for privacy. The next one is something Quanch and Thomas already touched upon, and this is the EU digital strategy with all the European regulations for the data economy. And, of, and again, we have Carlo Pilz, but we have another prominent figure, a dear friend of DataGuard, I, I, I dare to, to say. It's uh, Dr. Stefan Brink. Some of you may know him because it's the, he's the former State Data Protection Commissioner of Baden-Württemberg. He resigned from office um, end of last year, founded a scientific um, institute, and now has a very close collaboration with us, with DataGuard. We hosted a lot of master classes where you could address questions to him, and he will also shed some light on the new European regulations. So let's see what... What's coming up in 2024? There will be new regulations from the European Union, for example, on making public sector information accessible, on data sharing and on artificial intelligence. In all these projects, protected personal information is also affected and the GDPR always remains the anchor. So the GDPR will continue to prove its worth and those who are well advised here have a clear advantage. So, GDPR as the anchor, as a key takeaway. Second trend, Pils. intersection of European legislation and newly proposed European legislation with GDPR and data protection laws. Just think of the AI Act or the Data Act. It will be interesting to see how these new European proposals interact with GDPR when it comes to personal data and how these new rules will be enacted and implemented in practice. Thank you. So he also mentioned the Data Act and AI Act. And it's, it's funny because I uh, approached many thought leaders and they didn't know from each other and this uh, these statements weren't scripted, so it's their opinion and it's also our opinion, as we learned from Quanch and Thomas, that there is a, 
wave approaching us. And what we have to answer is uh, and question ourselves, are we ahead of this regulatory wave? Because uh, we, we mentioned it several times already, there are many laws uh, coming at us, approaching us at EU level concerning the access to and the handling of data. And all these acts must be implemented in and by companies and by authorities, um, but most of these acts only provide for special bodies and authorities for enforcement, but not for implementation like the GDPR does with the role of the DPO. And the role of the DPO is the perfect function because the DPO deals on a daily basis with the processing of data, of personal data, but as Quanch and Thomas already mentioned, um, there's a shift, there's a change of role in the DPO. In large corporations, um, the role of DPO will no longer be able to be limited, you know, to just the mere um, legal duties the DPO has under Articles uh, 37 to 39 GDPR, but the DPO has to think and act outside the box. And Group data protection officers in big and large organizations um, already do. We call it DPO 2.0, um, and the DPO in this respect has uh, the potential to become the most important stakeholder in a company's data strategy. strategy. And again, that's not only our opinion. You see here um, a quote from uh, Advocate General of the European Court of Justice. And three years ago, in a German case, Leistritz, which, which dealt about the role of data protection officer, he already exerted that the DPO is the key figure in the new data governance system. And how can this be tackled in practice? Let me give you two examples from big German um, players. First one is uh, Deutsche Post uh, DHL group and how they tackle the Data Act. Um, Thomas uh, mentioned the Data Act um, earlier, but let me just give you an example what the Data Act really is about. Um, one of the aims of the Data Act is um, to aim for cheaper prices for aftermarket aftermarket services and repair. And imagine there is a um, car manufacturer, let's take Volkswagen uh, again, and a factory robot in their plant breaks down. It's, a ve it's an IoT device nowadays, of course, it's, it's connected. And today only the manufacturer of that robot usually has access to the metadata in the robot. And um, the user, so Volkswagen, usually has no alternative but um, approaching the manufacturer of the robot um, and call them for repairing. The Data Act um, in future allows Volkswagen as the user to ask the manufacturer for access to the data and can approach a different repairing service that might be cheaper and faster. Um, and uh, how does the DPO come into play? Well, it's about access to data and data protection officers, many of you know it, there is the fundamental data subject right of access to data. So the DPO is already aware of that and can be one of the central dispute mediator when it comes to defense against claims. So if your uh, company is approached by external parties that data should be shared and given access to, or supporting you in enforcement of claims if you as a company want to have access to data. And this is why the data protection officer plays a key role in the Data Act. And this is how Gabriele Krada, she's the group data protection officer of Deutsche Post, um, has organized uh, her group privacy function. 
Another familiar face of, uh, for all of you who have participated in the last version of, of EPIC is Dr. Oliver uh, Draf. He gave the keynote um, uh, last year and he's the Group Data Protection Officer, we have mentioned it several times already, of Volkswagen. But he's not only the Group Data Protection Officer, um, he's now also responsible for digital risks. And he's a very um, smart guy and has uplifted his, his role. Why? Um, Quantum Thomas already shed some light on it. Um, back in 2016 and 2018, um, there was a hype. And um, the role of the DPO had the board attention and all the resources. But what we now see, and we, you will hear uh, another um, keynote from Michael Will, he's the head of um, Data Protection Authority here in Bavaria, and he talked about it in previous conferences, what I would call the privacy fa fatigue. Because five, more than five years after the GDPR coming into force, what we see now in privacy is, in data protection, that there is no high priority anymore. Less resources and less board attention. So what did the smart guy Oliver Draft do? Well, he ensured that he as a group data protection officer is also responsible for digital risks and digital risk incorporates one of the functions in his privacy department, the Data Act and the AI Act. So he got now new resources, new, new board attention, of course for this digital risk, but also for the entire uh, privacy practice. And that is a smart move. And we will see that um, again. And this is another example how the role of DPO uh, will change in future. So enough about privacy, let's head over to information security. Unfortunately, I have no video here, but a familiar face to, to you, Professor uh, Kipke, and he also uh, um, stated uh, to us that 2024 will be the cybersecurity year of the decade because of this too, and he also said, and I would strongly agree with it, that it will have comparable impact that the GDPR had on privacy. And Thomas and Quanch already explained why, um, in particular in, in, in terms of liability and the broad scope of applicability. But what I find most striking is the principle of effectiveness that it ha will be introduced through NIST 2 versus appropriateness that we see now. And um, at the moment, Many companies just do, uh, as Thomas already mentioned, uh, measures and check the box exercises. Of course, the measures need to be appropriate, so you need to assess whether they um, are sufficient enough to cope with cybersecurity threats, but in the future, they need to be effective. And effective means continuous assessment, but also pen testing. Um, tabletop exercises, dry runs, you really have to assess whether in the concrete case the measure you want to undertake is effective and that's something the executive management has to assess and monitor and sign off and that's the big game changer uh, together with the respective liability if they don't do and that's why um, uh, according uh, to, to Professor Kipke, uh, next year will be the cybersecurity decade, uh, the year of, of the decade. Um, another familiar face is Marnix Decker, and Quanch has already touched, uh, touched upon um, uh, this. So um, if you start with NIST 2, obviously have a certified um, ISMS because that will save you at least 70% of, of the job. So you don't have to reinvent uh, the wheel. You can recycle what you have and then uh, build, build on top. Um, we at DataGuard provide you with, with many resources in this respect. We have a 10-step plan uh, for you uh, how, how to as assess and what to do next. Um, I don't want to elaborate on all of this, but uh, just uh, um, uh, step number four, and that's also something Thomas and Quanch mentioned earlier, is budget. And Quanch provided the figure of 
overall a budget, more than 1 billion uh, uh, euros as a one-off, and then uh, more than 1.5 billion uh, annually. And uh, Marnix gave us a uh, really um, interesting figure during the webinar we held with him, uh, because all of the data ENISA had, the statistical data, they said if you have a certified information security management system like uh, ISO 271K, um, uh, uh, then uh, you need a budget increase of about 22%. Of course, this is only a ballpark uh, figure, but nonetheless, that's something you could work on and could use to negotiate an increased uh, uh, budget uh, in, in, in future. Another statement uh, from a distinguished uh, cybersecurity and data protection expert um, I want to touch upon um, is what Stefan Hessel here says about the legalization of uh, cybersecurity via NIST 2 in, in particular and as a um, takeaway, the cybersecurity functions need to team up with data protection. Why? There is a change in the role of the CISO F as well. Um, if we uh, go back in time 10 years ago, uh, and even five years ago, it was almost a mere tech-focused role, but it evolves more and more in the role of a risk and legal manager. Why? We learned that NIST 2 provides for a lot of um, requirements, but those requirements, they are often, and uh, the implementation laws will include vague and broad terms that need interpretation, um, and it ha also has big implications for liability. So um, with a lot of CISOs having a uh, tech background, this will be challenging. Um, and that's why um, Stefan Hessel proposes to team up uh, with uh, data uh, protection, and we see that um, on on the market as 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 well. You see here Toraf Knut from from Bosch and also David Zenger from from Gea Group, both international corporations with with uh, a billion turnover. And um, what's interesting is both are group data protection officers, but they are also head of information security um, and. Uh, you see here the, the merge of ISMS and DS, DMS um, because there are synergies to, to lever in terms of risk management, in terms of training and raising awareness, but also when it comes to incident uh, response. And those big corporations, they saw the synergies, they merged. Uh, of course, you, you would then maybe question, but what about the independency of the role of the DPO and also avoiding conflicts of interest? Well, those guys, they are responsible for the strategy and governance. Of course, there is a CISO in Bosch, uh, Bosch and there is a CISO in, in GEA, but they take over to implement the strategy and do uh, um, the, the daily business. That has also uh, to some extent to do with this shortage of workforce that Thomas uh, touch, touched upon and you really need uh, to lever the synergies. But you can see in the market it's already happening. What we are talking about here is not is, is something that we, we just have in our mind, but uh, the big companies are already implementing that and maybe you take that as an example for your organization. Last but not least, we have um, privacy, we have information security, and we have um, compliance. And the last statement is from my former boss before I joined DataGuard. He's a customer of ours, and he's also a distinguished um, previous EPIC speaker, Tobias Neufeld, and he will shed some lights on the upcoming trends um, in uh, HR compliance. 2024 will bring about changes to HR compliance and how companies mitigate their risk around employees and applicants. We can no longer rely on reference letters, but we will see a boost in background checks and professional betting services, despite the privacy challenges around that. 
And that's a quite interesting uh, uh, topic because what we also have in store here is a new German Employee Data Protection Act, uh, hopefully uh, coming into force next year, but there are currently uh, negotiations around it. And they will tackle those questions because there has been a position paper leaked in April this year. And the position paper, they, they outline 11 points that, uh, that the uh, German legislator want to tackle in terms of employee data protection. And the first three things are monitoring and surveillance. Then there is artificial intelligence. And last but not least, uh, the recruitment process. Um, and that will and needs to be a change also because there is quite of urgency here in Germany because the European Court of Justice um, in March this year has ruled on a German, um, German legislation on um, employee data protection and he found that this is not in compliance with EU law. So the German legislator has to act. Um, he will act. There are currently ne negotiations going on and it's to, uh, to be expected that we will have a first uh, draft bill by the end of the, we the year. And we in DataGuard are highly involved uh, in that as well because we engage in a lot of business associations like the Bitkom, like the Bundesverband der Datenschutzbeauftragten, like the IAPP. And um, we, are, we, we, we try to stay you know, ahead of the wave by giving our insights from our 3,000 customers, but also um, be one of the very first people to know what's going to happen. And Dr. Brink, who I also uh, mentioned, he's one um, of the experts that the German um, legislator has appointed to support them um, with defining a, a proper uh, wording. And speaking of Dr. Brink, um, if you want to hear more about this topic, there will be um, an event hosted by us on the 23rd of, of November where we're tackling all um, employee data protection and what the, the upcoming bill has in store. So you're kindly in, invited to, to join us. And with having four minutes left and giving uh, you, you some, some ample time and having uh, catch up a little bit, um, uh, the, the final outlook. And uh, as again in, in my speech, it's not me giving you the final outlook, but uh, another person, and again, Dr. Stefan Brink. Um, so let's see what he has to say about um, what will happen uh, next year as a holistic reflection. What will happen in 2024? This is hard to say, given the rapid pace of technological progress. But it is possible to predict what will not change. The GDPR will remain the global model for good data protection. Those who are well positioned in terms of data protection need not fear the future and will still be ahead of the game in 2024. And I think that's a, a, a nice closing remark. I mean, we talked about things that will change, but something that's here to stay is the GDPR. And if you have the GDPR and it will interact with all the upcoming acts, as Dr. Brink said, you are well positioned. And with uh, uh, having said that, I wish you a very, very exciting and um, epic, a lot of good talks, good networking, good beer, and a lot of celebration afterwards at the Wiesen. Um, thank you for your attention. <laughs>